Okay, and then today Sam will be speaking on Psalm 23, verses 1 to 3. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest night, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all of the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And now we will have our special speaker, Sam. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's, it's good to be back. Uh, it seems like every year around this time, um, uh, the cans either go on vacation or they have some conference to go to, and I'm the backup. So uh, I found out that I thought the Pastor Cannon and CLA were going to be here, but I see in the bulletin that they're actually in New York this week. So um, I'm covering for him. Um, it's good to be back to normal. Um, I was gone like for over for about three weeks um, in Colorado, Utah, and Arizona, and the whole time is basically had people cleaning up for me, cooking for me, um, driving me around. Didn't have to do anything, and coming back to normal, having to do all that stuff again was just kind of weird. Um, and then going back to work. Um, the hardest thing was not working. It was staying awake because I've been so used to being outdoors and like staring at trees and water and rivers and everything. And all of a sudden, I have to stare at my whiteboard and my computer screen all day. Um, so it was quite an adjustment. But it's good to be back to normal. And this is really part of normal, being part of uh, being back at this church, being in front of you all, being able to share my story. I think a lot of you guys know bits and pieces of, of what has happened um, with me in the past uh, several months, but I'll clue in everyone else and also fill in some of the blanks and, and some of the other things that, that have happened. Um, but let's begin with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today, Lord, for gathering us together. In this sanctuary, Lord, we pray that our hearts and our minds will be totally devoted to you at this time, Lord, as we worship you, Lord. We pray that you'll speak through me, Lord, to convey the message of, of hope and just um, um, taking a stand, Lord. And Father, we pray for those who aren't with us today, uh, for the cans who are uh, representing our church, Lord, in New York. We pray that uh, the time that they spend there um, uh, with other ministry members, Lord, will be fruitful and just uh, that they'll come back with a lot of great ideas, Lord. And we just pray these things in your son's name. Amen. So the title of, um, what? I have no idea if my mic's on. Steven, is my mic on? This, no, this is for recording. So somebody asked me to record this so they can get this. No, I don't want a mic. I don't want any wires on me. I'm tired of wires and everything. Um, OK. Okay, so this is actually going to benefit me, too, because I'm wearing the wrong pair of glasses today. Um, so the title of today's message is, um, you can see, uh, for those of you who are iPhone owners, uh, you may look at this as 10 days. Uh, for Android people, I had a, a Motorola X Pure phone, so it's X days. Both of you will be correct, whether you call it X or 10. This is a, a picture. I, I cannot take selfies for the life of me, so this is the closest I got. This is at uh, Canyonlands National Park in Utah. So last week I had the privilege of sitting in the um, college, post-college class uh, Sunday school, and they, they played categories before um, class really got going. And um, for those of you not familiar with the game, I hope I don't butcher it, but basically there's categories and then there's a letter and you're supposed to say things associated with that letter. I'm still a little bit upset at the game, even though I think I won the game, but I'm upset because I'm kind of a, a stickler for like 
following rules. And I didn't know that there's a rule that you can't use foreign languages. And the, the letter was N, and the category was things that are found in a refrigerator. And you know, being trying to score is you have to try to come up with something that no one else says. Um, I said Nong Juk, which I thought should have counted, but they said no foreign languages, so I, I got a zero on that one. Um, but so I wanted to tackle today with the letter, oops, C. <laughs> and I'm going to go over things that I'm found, fond of. So um, my alma mater is not just Cal. It's the California College of Chemistry. That should be three points right there. Uh, I'm, more, I'm more attuned to what's going in my specific school within Cal than I am with the general uh, Cal campus. Um, extended non-blood family members. I would say my number one godson sitting over there, Caleb. <laughs> I don't know how old he was back then, but uh, I, that was a picture that I just took a picture of a picture. And then my go-to dessert would be, sorry, chocolate cake. No nuts, none of that raspberry stuff that goes in the middle. It's just pure chocolate with chocolate frosting. Um, those would be three things that I'm super fond of. But um, in life, we don't always get to choose. And when I was on vacation, we, uh, we ate a lot of food. And one of the things that... Um, is special this time of year in, in the particular part of uh, Colorado we were in, is that they have um, uh, discounted meals because everyone's on, um, like, they don't go to that area unless it's summer or it's skiing, and it's like just at the wrong time. So I went to this restaurant. Uh, they said it was three courses, and you could choose from the first course and the third course. So my first course, I chose corn bisque. It's, um, it's like this creamy corn soup with um, some spices in, in it. So it was really good. Um, I don't know if it was fatty or whatever, but it was really good. Uh, and then for my main course, I ordered um, salmon with pureed um, uh, sweet potatoes and baby carrots and some other weird words in it um, that I'm not really sure what they were, but it all tasted really good. Now, this third course actually came between the first and third courses. It's called an intermezzo. I had no idea what an intermezzo was. It's considered a palate cleaner. If you take a look at it, I'm not sure how, how clean that picture is on the screen, but it's red, and there's some white stuff and some brown stuff on it. And, and I was hoping that it was you know, maybe some strawberry um, sorbet with um, bits of marshmallows or whipped cream with um, chocolate sauce on it. No, it's not it. This is something that was created at the inspiration of the chef of, of the restaurant and based on seasonable, seasonable uh, availability of, of uh, materials. And this is what it was. Black cherry. Good, right? Everyone likes cherry. Good stuff. Black cherry and beet sorbet. Now, I don't know if you guys uh, regularly eat beets, but basically, um, if you can imagine licking dirt, that's what beets taste like. It's, it's not the, the greatest flavor. Um, and then blue cheese, that's the white stuff. And then you, put, you mix all that together, and you add the brown stuff. Balsamic vinegar. And what was interesting was that the, the waiter kept on coming back and asking us, oh, how, how are you enjoying the intermezzo? And, you know, we're a, we were adults. I was with my sister and brother-in-law, and you can't say what you want to say. You have to be an adult about it. He said, it's, it's an interesting combination. <laughs> that's, that's, what I, that's what I told the waiter. But in reality, what I really wanted to say was, yuck! <laughs> What possessed you to even come up with something like that? It, it was really gross. But um, because the whole purpose of a palate cleanser is to take away the whatever was on your tongue from the first course so that you can truly enjoy the third course. But I like the spiciness in my soup, and I don't think it would have detracted any from the, the salmon. Um, but, you know, in life, we don't always get to choose. Um, as much as we, 
we like to think that we're totally in control. We, we aren't totally in control. And now I'm going to drop the bomb on you. It's the C. Um, a C you never want to hear. Cancer. It's a disease caused by an uncontrolled, so this is a scientific definition, uncontrolled division of abnormal cells in a part of the body. So uh, a few months ago, I was, I was told I have cancer. And it was like, <laughs> um, this is a real shock. And I want to give you guys a timeline of, of events. So this is the timeline. Um, and even before, before the first one on the, July 17th, so the day after the, um, the July 4th picnic, uh, I went for a, a, a seven-mile run, which is like my normal run. I was trying to get ready for a race in August. And uh, I, I don't look at myself normally, but then it was kind of weird. I turned my body after I showered, and I looked at myself, and I'm like, that's kind of weird. That's like there's this thing on my back. And it didn't hurt, but I, I had felt something on my back for probably a few weeks because it felt tight. And I thought maybe it was just because I was buffing up because I started doing some upper body stuff and you know, it's like, Ugh. But um, actually, uh, after going to see a couple of doctors uh, with Kaiser, uh, they said, well, okay, you're gonna need to take care of that and it's not something that you can just take a pill for or you can't zap it with radiation, you have to cut it out. So, so the first doctor I went to, she cut it out. Uh, and at the end of the appointment, she made a follow-up saying that a nurse will call you uh, on the 24th. Well, on the 24th, the doctor calls me. So you know that it's not good when the doctor calls you after she says the nurse will call you. And when the doctor called me, she says, oh, yeah, it popped right out. So if you can imagine, okay, I'm going to gross you out a little bit, but if you... you can imagine like fall yoke hanging in front of the store. What she said she did basically was she cut through the skin and she just scooped out uh, a little glob of fat and it just popped right out. It, there was no like um, complication that she had during the procedure. But when they ran tests on it, she says, oh yeah, it, it actually turned out to be cancer. And it was weird because she's been doing this procedure for 16 years and I was the third case. And you figure, you know, she's probably done hundreds of this. And I'm the third person that she's had uh, where this turned out to be cancer. And I was like, man, that's not, that's, that's just messed up. So she said I would have to talk to another doctor, which, which I did that day. And to get technical, uh, when they thought it was just a lump of fat, it's considered a lipoma. And when they said that it was cancer, she said it's a liposarcoma. So the second doctor gave me some facts, um, and you know my mind was basically in a in a fog. It's like when when somebody says that c word, you, you don't hear anything afterwards. It was just like, um, I, and I was in a daze. But he said that one of the things I needed to do was to get an MRI, a magnetic resonance imaging thing, uh, so that they could tell how big of an area. Um, the, the cancer had spread because he needs to know how much he needs to take out. So with the first surgery, the doctor said she was just going to scoop out the, the lump of fat. So going back to the folio uh, example, um, they would have to actually go in, take out a little bit of the meat. So some muscle would be taken out. And he was giving me like a range of things that could, could be uh, resulting from the surgery. He said that you could lose a lot of strength. But really, it's dependent on what shows up in the MRI. And, and after the MRI, um, I had a, another appointment with the doctor. Uh, and he told me the prognosis on August 2nd. And then on August 21st, um, he performed the surgery, which was much more invasive, um, because he was telling me that I might need skin grafts, that he'll take skin from other parts of my body to cover back up um, the area that he operated on. So that's the timeline. And just to get to the end of the story, it was good. Um, prognosis turned out good. Uh, I wouldn't make the, the prognosis a smiley face. The smiley face would have been, oops, we misread the report. Actually, you don't have anything. It was just, it was somebody else's report. You're, you're, you're actually OK. Uh, I went from fear and, and like just being worried to just kind of relieved because 
he basically told me that the, um, uh, the form of cancer that I had is something that doesn't spread to other parts of the body. Uh, it doesn't go to the bone. It doesn't go to um, uh, internal organs, which would have been much more severe. Uh, and that basically, it's just going to hurt. Um, I can deal with hurt um, because, you know, since I had gone through one surgery, uh, I can, uh, I'll figure out what to do with the, with the pain. But just knowing that um, the, the whole uh, thing with um, uh, the, the recovery and the prognosis being somewhat positive uh, just was a big relief. Um, so the next slide I'll show you is going to be the steps, baby steps in recovery. There's four pictures that I've sent out to people. Um, and this is over the past like seven weeks. Um, one of the things that the, that the doctors told me and the nurses too after surgery was um, it's going to hurt and it's going to hurt a lot. So they're going to prescribe me a lot of pain medication and take it even if it doesn't hurt. Get ahead of the pain. So I had oxycodone, which you, a lot of you guys probably heard is addictive. Um, I had super strength Motrin, which actually to me was the one that worked the best. And I had Tylenol, which is just basically stuff you would buy at Costco. So I was like throwing those in my mouth for a couple of days. I didn't feel anything, I had no pain. I was able to lie down on my back, which felt really good. Um, walking around, I could do stuff as long as I didn't have to raise my arm too high. I was able to do pretty much everything. Um, but when I would like text or email people, um, you know, whenever they would ask, how are you doing? And I would say, well, you know, I'm not feeling a lot of pain. I think the recovery is going pretty well. Um, and that's generally how most people would interact with me. How are you doing? Are you in pain? Uh, generally questions like that. Um, so I have a sister who's a pharmacist and she's, I would say she's kind of like a hamster. She just cannot, she doesn't sit still. So uh, she likes exercising and doing all sorts of stuff. And she knows side effects with, with medication and everything. Her first response to me was, why are you taking so many pain medications? And when are you gonna start rehabbing? And I was like going, whoa, too soon, too soon. Wait, you can ask me that question like three weeks from now, but right now, I shot her the first email four days after the surgery. I pooped today. Um, because of all the, the, the pain medication, the antibiotics and the anesthesia that uh, I had to be pumped into my body, I could not poop. Um, and I felt like such a champion. So when I found that picture, I sent that picture to her and go, yeah, I pooped today. Um, so another stage of the recovery um, deals with um, fluid buildup in, in the surgical area. One of the problems that I had with the first surgery was that um, there was a lot of like wherever they did the surgery on, it filled right back up with uh, bodily fluid and basically I felt like Quasimodo because I had like a hump there and I couldn't really move my arm I couldn't sleep on my back so it was really really difficult to, to do anything um, but with the second surgery the doctor inserted a tube in that spot and that tube was kind of like hooked up um, and went around my body and I had a little bulb here and a couple times a day I would empty the bulb out just to, you know, just with whatever built up uh, that was draining. And um, my niece, who is a nurse, uh, she was nurse of the year at our hospital this year. She asked me this question, Uncle Stan, for $500,000, $500, would you drink the drainage that came out of the bulb? <laughs> and I shot this picture back to her and go, uh, I'm never going to drink Kool-Aid again because that's basically the color of the stuff that came out. And um, in total, over the, the two weeks that I had that tube in me, it was probably about um, 400 milliliters, which is a little less than your regular sized um, plastic water bottle. So you can imagine that building up in your, in your back and just how uncomfortable that would be. That's what I had in me. So um, that, that's the reason for the second picture. 
So the third picture is a picture of the great Alfonso Ribeiro uh, from uh, Dancing with the Stars. Not that I watched the show, but from what I understand, he, he was the greatest, this is the greatest performance ever on the show. And he was doing the Carlton dance on the show. So you can look that up and watch the video later. But um, two weeks after my surgery, um, the doctor took the tube out of um, the, my back and it felt so good because I didn't have like the thing in me anymore. And it's kind of like how when Stephen asked me to put the mic on and have this thing on today, I was like, oh man, I gotta have all this stuff on me. It just feels so unnatural. But uh, I, was, I was telling people that the, the way I felt after he took the, the tube out of me was kind of like being able to do the Carlton dance in, in Tai Chi speed because up until that point, I didn't feel comfortable raising my arm at all. And finally, when, when the tube came out, I was able to get my arm up. I'm not going to do the dance for you guys, so don't even bother asking. Um, and then the last picture is of me from uh, like 10 days ago. I was having a uh, dinner with my uh, niece in Phoenix, and I was showing her how flexible I can be now. So. All along, I, my left arm, which is my good arm, I could reach around my head and touch the corner of my mouth, uh, the right side. But um, since the surgery with, uh, on, the left, on the right side, I could only reach the earlobe. But uh, at dinner, I was able to reach all the way around. So can try it, you know, see if you can do it. Yeah, so <laughs> it's a curse sometimes. But um, being able to reach all the way around just and being able to show off 50 days after surgery uh, was, was a real um, uh, milestone to me to be able to do that. Um, so th these are the baby steps in recovery that I've gone through. And I think um, just, just being able to, to go through all of that and just uh, have humor involved in it kind of helped too. Um, but this sermon is really not about cancer is part about, partly about it, but it's not really about cancer or recovery or dealing with just physical pain. Um, this, the real crux of this message is about the waiting game. Um, so when I was told on uh, the 24th by the doctors that I had cancer, I had to wait until August 2nd, which is 10 days. X equals 10, so whether you look at the X as a 10 or a variable, it was 10 days that I had to wait before I could really find out from the doctors um, what was going on with me. Um, because, you know, like if you sprain an ankle, you know, you could just titajo it or you could do other things and go to see a Western doctor and figure out, you know, you can kind of tell about how long uh, it's going to be before um, you'll heal up. But with, with something like cancer, it's like, there's, there's just nothing that you can really um, predict. Even though they, they had mentioned that it's kind of a slow-growing type of cancer, it, it wasn't something that I felt confident in because I was three out of a couple hundred from the first doctor's experience that actually uh, came back with cancer. And I was, went through all these, these thoughts and Thinking back on the songs that we, we were singing this morning, you know, we talked. About, we, we had verses about being in valleys and being in dark places, and I, I went through dark places for these ten days, um, thinking about: um, Is my arm going to need to be amputated? You know, it's that would be like super extreme, but it's like how much of the muscle is going to have to be removed? Why me? Because. If you look at the stuff that I eat on Sunday morning, which generally correlates to what I eat during the week, and I eat organic raspberries, organic oranges, and organic blueberries. I'm not eating bacon all the time. Why? You know, I, I stopped eating potato chips, for goodness sakes. Why me? Yeah, maybe, maybe I should start eating that stuff again. So I, I, maybe my body is used to that. Um, and, and just like pity sometimes, you know, woe is me. Um, and thinking about how um, different things will be if it spread and it went to other parts of my body. So for those 10 days, it was just really difficult. And, and I would like 
uh, wake up in the middle and I could not sleep at all, partly because I had the swelling in my back, but partly because, you know, like 2 a.m. in the morning, I just wake up and think, uh, what if I only have use of my left arm for the rest of my life? It's, it's a possibility. You just don't know. Um, but um, there are certain things that, that brought me back, uh, refocused me and reestablished where, where my mind needed to be. And, and uh, the reason I chose um, Psalm 23 is it kind of brings us through different phases. If you look at the first three verses, uh, I would say these are the up stages. Now, we're not sheep, but imagine that you're lying on pasture and somebody's feeding you grapes or bringing you an endless supply of boba or, you know, crumbled bacon. And, you know, it's like you're, you're being taken care of. You're being pampered. That just feels so wonderful. That's the place we want to be because we don't want to be the other place. The other place where there's downs, where you're in dark valleys. Now, this talks of, of David and his experience with you know, real enemies, but in our lives, we may not have someone who's out to get us, but we have emotional things, spiritual things that are, are dragging us down, even physical things that are dragging us down. And, and we don't really want to be in this place. We want to be hopping on a magic carpet so we can go back to Psalm 23, 1 to 3. Even though this promises us that God is with us in the valley, and that he's going to prepare a table for us in the presence of our enemies. We really would rather be in the pasture by the streams where everything is so nice and comfortable. But this is part of life. You know, this is, we're going to go through ups and downs, and we need to be able to face that. Because in the end, God promises us that through every situation, his goodness will be with us all the days of our lives. Not just the days where, where we're feeling comfortable, but also the days where we're feeling um, down. And when I thought of, of, of Psalm 23 and just the situation that I was in with my, my physical health, it, it kind of brought me back to reality. And there's a couple other things that, that kind of hit me. Um, my phone, I, I have a verse of the day thing stuck on one of my screens. And for about a month, and I don't know why, is is coincidence or whatever, maybe God's speaking to me, this verse was frozen on my phone. Matthew 6.34, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. If you look at this verse by itself, um, we could be tempted to look at just, okay, just don't worry, and all will be good. But we have to look at everything in context. Because it's not just the absence of worry that God is telling us. If you look at the context of Matthew 6, from 31 to 33, we're also told to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So it's not just don't worry, but it's also seek God first, because that's the important thing, and that will, will result in the lack of worry. Um, another thing that... that it, uh, I did in the middle of the night. Um, for the first few days when I was going through my little pity party uh, thing, um, you know, wake up in the middle of the night, 2 a.m., turning on Netflix. Um, so there's a show that I've been watching called Cheers. It's before a lot of you guys were probably coherent. But it was uh, 11 seasons, and I'm, I think I'm on a season 11 now. But if you can imagine how many episodes there are of that show, I wake up at 2 in the morning and just watch like two or three episodes of Cheers before I would fall asleep and then, you know, wake up another hour later and I'd watch another couple episodes. That was the way I would pass time in between pity party thoughts and, and, and worry thoughts. But um, I would start praying. And if you can imagine in the middle of the night how hard it is to think, uh, I, I'm a, a creature of habit. I like um, structure. So it's easy for me to remember the Lord's Prayer. So I would just recite the Lord's Prayer over and over. Instead of watching TV, uh, I would recite the Lord's Prayer. But I added something to it um, and asked God to um, take care of those who are hurting spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Because it's not just physical pain that people struggle with. It's also spiritual pain and emotional pain. Um, and, and knowing that people were praying for me, um, 
this set me back on the path that it's not just people praying for me, but there's other people that I need to pray for also. When they share uh, prayer requests with me, uh, you know, a lot of times it's, oh, I'll pray for you. But in reality, you know, okay, that's just, that's just the thing we say. But in reality, really going through and praying for those others because um, prayer is powerful. James tells us that in, in James chapter 5 that, that uh, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective, and that knowing that we can affect um, how others are, are going through their situations by praying for them is a powerful thing to know. And, and that kind of set me uh, along the right path also. Um, so that's what I did. So in the Bible, there's a couple other folks who went through situations where they had days or periods of time where they had doubts or they weren't really sure what they're going through. You have Jonah. He was in the, the, um, the belly of the fish for three days. And what was he doing? He was praying. And what did he do after that he prayed? He went and he preached in Nineveh, just like he was commanded to at the beginning uh, by God. Then we have Thomas. Um, for him, it was eight days. And Thomas is one of those guys in the Bible who he seems to get a bad rap because anytime you hear the name Thomas, you also associate the word doubting right in front of it. But if you look at the different accounts of, of the appearances of Jesus to people after the resurrection, um, he wasn't the only one who doubted. There, if you look in Luke, others were also either, uh, either didn't recognize it was Jesus or they also had their doubts. But, but Thomas was a guy who's just, he's singled out, and sometimes we, we give him a bad rap in thinking that, oh, he doubted, therefore he's not as cool as the others. But I'm thinking about the situation. If you look at the passage in, in John 20, um, Jesus had appeared to the other um, 10 disciples because Judas was gone, so there were 11 left. So the other 10, they already got their appearance. Jesus also appeared to, to several women um, at the tomb, and he also appeared to several folks on the, on the way to the, uh, to the city called Emmaus. So from, from one perspective, you could say, well, if I was in Thomas's shoes, I could feel that I was left out. Why did he appear to those other people but not me? Um, so... I think it's a natural response where he wanted to be able to, to stick the finger in the hole, to be able to, to just to test for himself. And what did he do afterwards? Now, a lot of the, the um, things that we learn about um, church history is based on things that are not written in the Bible. But um, there's the traditions say that Thomas, uh, he went to the East and he, he witnessed and preached and established churches in India. And, and all over the place. So he did a lot of great stuff afterwards. So he didn't, he, he expressed doubt, but he didn't run away. He came back to go and meet with his brothers to go and see, is this Jesus? And he actually did it. And he af after he did it, he went and he preached the word. Then we have Joseph. For him, we're not talking about days, we're talking about years. And he was sold by his brothers and what did he do? He could have had a pity party for 20 years. And while he did mess with his brothers, as, as we studied in, in the book of Genesis, um, and gave him a hard time for a little bit, but in the end, what he had done all along was he prepared himself for service. And he set himself up in a situation where he could help his brothers. And he forgave them. And that's all just stuff that these, these three, three other examples with um, Jonah and um, Thomas and uh, Joseph, they were able to, to um, use their situation, use their circumstances, grow from it, and also benefit others in the future. So what good came out of all this? So if we ever play a game of who has the longest scar, I, I'm not sure if I'll win, but I'm going to finish top three. Uh, I think I have a, it's probably 12 inches. I'm not going to show you, but it's, it's a pretty long scar. Um, being able to, to talk with people who have walked a walk, I would call them Sherpas. Um, 
it's, it's, it's interesting how sometimes it's like you, you might think you're the only one who's ever gone through different circumstances, but when you talk to someone who's gone through that situation before um, and being able to like just share stories about what you've gone through, it's, it's so amazing. Um, not, just, not just with the physical recovery, but also uh, dealing with human resources at work and going back to work and the, the different things that I needed to do um, and, and how, how to explain to people you know, what you're going through. Um, that was really powerful, being able to talk with other people who've, who've gone through similar um, circumstances. Um, I can truly say that I have a strength and faith in my shepherd. Um, knowing that God has carried me through this stage uh, it has, has really lifted me up. And also being able to, to say that I'm truly out of this valley, that now I can stand here on this proverbial, you know, have a, a mountaintop, but I can stand here and share this story with you and hopefully encourage you. But I wanted to throw a what-if situation to you. So on my um, hikes in Colorado, uh, every once in a while we'll have to cross um, small streams. And there's these people who, um, who work for the Forest Service or the National Parks. They build little bridges. And, you know, it's not like Bay Bridge or Golden Gate Bridge. It's just wooden bridges that, that are built up so that uh, people can cross. <clears throat> um, last uh, winter, the Colorado had tons of avalanches, a lot of snow, and the... Uh, a lot of structures and things that were built up got destroyed. So this isn't exactly the same spot, but we had a bridge uh, where this middle location was. So I don't know if you can really see, but my sister is on the other side of, the, uh, of that log, and it's just this log. She's a little over five feet tall, so the log crossing across the, that river is probably about 10 feet. And it's probably about, from the water to the land, it's probably about eight feet. If, if you guys recall, I think the first sh sermon I shared, I uh, talked about how I'm deathly afraid of walking across narrow um, uh, surfaces because um, back when I was in high school, the gym teacher made the guys do exercises on balance beams. And ever since then, I've just been scared of walking across anything that's narrow. Um, so I, I, I looked at this and I go, sis, we're turning back. There's no way I'm going across that thing because uh, I can't walk through the water to, um, to, to get across because it's, it's too, too deep. Um, so that's, that's it. But as I walked a few more steps, this is what I saw. It's actually an optical illusion that there are actually five logs there, not just one. And um, it actually wasn't too bad. I was able to walk across, and I did like just walked on logs two and four instead of the, the ones on the edge. Um, if you think about the, the, the many different circumstances, the different diagnoses that I could have had, um, I think I got off kind of easy with this. Um, and just going through a couple of months of pain. Um, but there could have been worse diagnoses. And, and, and I, I can't honestly say that I know how I would react uh, if I got a different prognosis from the doctor. But one thing I can say is that I truly believe that no matter what the diagnosis was, whether it was something where I had just a few more months to live or you know whatever, um, I can say that there would still be a log for me to, t uh, to go to God. Um, a bad diagnosis is not the absence of, of, of God. God will still be there. The log will still be there to, to, to take you home. And I think that's something that, that um, I've read different devotionals um, where uh, some of the, the writers would kind of indicate, well, there's, just pray it away. And it's like, well, you know what, sometimes, you know, we've all gone through situations with family members, um, you know, people that we love who, you know, you pray super hard for them, 
and the medical response, the medical outcome is not what you really would hope for. But, but sometimes the bigger picture is that there's more than just the medical outcome, there's the spiritual outcome. And I, I firmly believe that I, I would still have that log to God, uh, even though physically it would have been more difficult if, if, the, if the diagnosis was different, that I would still have that log back to God to take me on home to heaven. So that's my encouragement for, all, for you all, just no matter what circumstances you're going through. Um, because to me, what was going on with me was health. But for you, it may be com- something completely different. Is it a decision you need to make? Is it reconciliation with uh, a relationship? Um, assurance of eternal salvation. Just a general purpose in life. Why are we here? You know, all of these things, people in this room, we may be waiting on, on an answer for those things. And hopefully, while we're waiting, that we're going to be preparing, just like Joseph did in setting himself up for, for great works for God, that we'll remember that God's goodness and his love will follow us all the days of our lives. Not just the good days, not just the bad days, but all the days of our lives. And that we'll remember that we will be with him forever. And that, that's my encouragement for all of us. So...